it would have been nearly four years ago, or almost exactly four years ago in March of 2018, and I was a first year student, uh, just been a few weeks into uni, and I was living here in St. Lucia in a share house. Uh, it was three of us, three boys, and they were off at uni. And I had the house all to myself. And as you can imagine, with three boys who had just moved from home into a new house, it was pretty messy. So I had to clean the house. And you know, being a student and whatnot, I had readings to do, readings that I didn't want to do. And there was a reading I had to do on uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, the great Renaissance uh, political theorist. And there was some, you know, 40 page reading uh, to do with that that I was didn't want to get around to, and I had a house to clean, so I thought, you know what, I'll just go and I'll find a good, a good YouTube video on Nicola Machiavelli, and that way I can just put that on the background while I clean the house and I don't have to do the reading, so that'll, that'll get all, all, you know, all, 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 everything I want to do, I can just do it all like that, so I searched up Nicola Machiavelli, and there it was, a, something like a 40 minute long video that looked promising, Nicola Machiavelli dash Will the Rings. I thought, oh my, that's great. And so I popped that on and I got to scrubbing out the shower. And the first thing that kind of caught my attention about this video was the voice. Uh, the person doing the narration had a voice that I since heard described as sandpaper and velvet. It's this very you know, classic American gravelly accent. It has all these musical inflections. And it got me really hooked. And the second thing that I uh, sort of hooked me was just how kind of engaging and how well written it was. You know, it was sort of really, how it had a real style and, and, and flair to it. And it's sort of a bit of a wit as well. It was sophisticated, but it was still accessible. So I thought, of, uh, you know, I wanted to hear more of this. Um, you know, apparently this belonged to a whole series. It wasn't just Nicolo Machiavelli this time I'd written about. It was apparently all of civilization itself in a big series called The Story of Civilization. And so I, you know, searched up a little bit about it and I went and, you know, tried, tried to find the particular audio book of this narrator and I managed to find it on a, uh, a website that sort of looked like it hadn't been updated since 1998, you know, one of those real old school style ones where they had a whole series available for just $10. And I thought, gee, I don't know why. That's pretty good. And it turns out that, that was an extraordinarily good deal. So that was 11 volumes worth of, of material for just $10. And once I downloaded the file, I found out that the whole thing was 435 hours long. So I, I got on this uh, whole series for, what's that, for four cents, four and a half cents per hour. So that's the reason one why I should really well, I should read Will the Rain, because it was a bargain, apparently. <laughs> and, um, so I endeavoured to, to listen to the story of civilization. that's what the series is called, and there it is, all 11 volumes of it. Uh, it comes to 4 million words, which, if you're familiar with uh, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, it's a sort of epic series of novels that is famously long, really long, but that only comes to a million words. This is four million, this is four times that. This is impossible, this is mammoth. Bertrand Russell once wrote that there are two motives for reading a book. One, that you enjoy it, and the other, that you can boast about it. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed listening to Will Laurent, and today I get to boast about it. Although I will add in a bit of a caveat, which is that four years on, I have not yet finished it. I'm only up to volume seven. <laughs> the other five is that's still a mystery to me, but I'll, I'll spend another four years getting around to it, I'm sure. So, who is Will Durant? Well, Will Durant was born in 1885. Uh, he was an American. Who was of Quebec heritage, like the great Nicolas Desjardins. <laughs> uh, his family uh, moved to New Jersey 
where we, you know, I was, you know, Catholic upbringing and very Catholic education as well. And because of this, he went on to teach Latin in school. And from there, he sort of moved on to actual you know, becoming a teacher in school. And it was there in 1913, whatever it was the school in New Jersey, where at 28 years old he met the love of his life, Ariel Durant. Uh, the only problem was that she was a 15-year-old pupil at the school. So it was different times, I guess, and they got married that year. Um, and despite this rather questionable start to their relationship, they went on to live a long and happy life and they flourished together. And I sort of really misnamed this uh, talk and saying why I should why I should read Will Durant because really it's Will and Ariel Durant. Um, as you can see from volume seven onwards, she actually becomes the co-author of this series because she helped research and helped him write it and sort of really were a, a, a power couple of history writing. Um, once Will had married Ariel, he sort of you know, dabbled in journalism a little bit. Um, went back to university to study philosophy and philosophy really went hooked and he sort of found a lot of he had a lot of issues with the way that philosophy was taught and how it was written and how it was approached he sort of thought it was far too scholarly far too kind of sterile and um, you know hooky talky I guess and this sort of you know led him to kind of you know think you know gee I can, I can do something about this and I want to write philosophy for the people, make it accessible, make it kind of, you know, find it interesting and not just, you know, a great big lecture or something. And so because of this, he went on to write the story of philosophy in 1926. <laughs> this was originally published as part of a series of educational works uh, for American workers, but this sort of blew up and became kind of a hit overnight. Just, you know, it was sort of just supposed to be kind of a, a bit of an you know, educational pamphlet, but it actually went, you know, was picked up by proper publishers and it sort of blew up. Um, and, you know, he, he came back and wrote a preface for the second edition, so once this thing had kind of become a bit of a hit. And he attributed the book's success to a public thirsting for accessible, easy knowledge that they didn't have to go to college for. Uh, that wasn't dull or specialised or jargon heavy. And this is what he wrote. He said that human knowledge had become unmanageably vast. Every science and every branch of philosophy developed a technical terminology intelligible only to its exclusive devotees. In the midst of unprecedented learning, popular ignorance flourished. And the common man found himself forced to choose between a scientific priesthood mumbling unintelligible pessimism and a theological priesthood mumbling incredible hopes. He, he became a lapsed Catholic, as you can tell. In this situation, the function of the professional teacher was clear. It should have been to mediate between the specialist and the nation, to learn the specialist language as the specialist had learned nations, in order to break down the barriers between knowledge and need, to find for new truths old terms that all literate people might understand. And he called this in the humanization of knowledge. And that's sort of why um, the story of philosophy kind of remains so readable, is because you sort of, you know, trying to make everything accessible, you didn't dwell, you know, you can get things with, with too much jargon or anything, you know, it's not overly complex. You tried to make philosophy something engaging, something that was about life and for life, rather than just sort of a, a scholarly enterprise. Um, but of course, this uh, was criticised somewhat, and the work was accused of being, you know, of, of being overly general and guilty of oversimplifications. And of course, there are entire branches of philosophy that you just completely ignore the tricky and trickier philosophy of, of epistemology and metaphysics. You just you know, had no time for it. And in the preface, he funded no apology. It is offered for the ne neglect of epistemology. That dismal science received its due in the chapter on Kant, where for many pages the reader was invited to consider the puzzles of perception. This chapter should have pleased the young pundit, 
where it came very close to obscurity. There was a bit of that room there in the uh, music. So, um, you know, I suppose that that's one of the conundrums, I guess, of popular philosophy and of popular history is, you know, in trying to sort of convey um, inaccurately or poorly information, do you simply just cut things out or they're really too complex? Do you try and hammer away as he did on his chapter in Kant, which I've read three times and still don't understand? <laughs> or you know, do you just try and you know, just sort of make it as simple as possible to come up smooth over a lot of the difficult things. It's tricky. And this is Will Durant's approach, which is just to sort of find the nuggets that are interesting and just kind of emphasize those. And if some things are just boring, well then they're boring and they're not really worth studying. So that's that's what he says, which you know I, I think is a worth worth considering, you know. <laughs> Enjoyed the, the popularity and financial successes that was brought by the story of philosophy. You have to kind of travel the world, of course, as we all dream of. Um, and it still remains a popular book. I mean, if you go into any, any bookstore and it's a new bookstore, you might find a new copy. It'll certainly be in, in every second hand bookstore in the philosophy section, you'll find some brand new copy of it. But he He thought that he could go on to humanise history, not just philosophy. And with an eye for H.G. Wells' A Short History of the World, he decided, why don't I just do all of history, every single bit of it, right from the beginning, right to the end. And so the first volume of this new series, which he called The Story of Civilization, was Our Oriental Heritage, which he published in 1935. This work begins with human prehistory and it continues to a history of the ancient Near East, so you know, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and so on, all the way until the uh, Achaemenid Empire. And then it sort of ambles on into the histories of India, China, and Japan from their beginnings right up to what was then the present day in 1935. And sort of in, justif in justifying why he sort of opens up uh, focusing on the Oriental world, he's poured scorn on those who thought there was no. Uh, history worthy of study outside of Europe. And he noted that Western civilization, as it appeared in the East, was often quite shameful. He lamented how the British had ravaged India during their century and a half of colonial rule, and he has sort of long passages on that. But he sort of added to that that uh, a sort of a universalist interpretation of human history, which sort of underscores. Uh, sort of a humanist vision of studying the past. And reflecting on this, he wrote uh, sort of a bit later, uh, or a few decades later after the publication of Oriental Heritage, he said, racial antipathies have some roots in ethnic origin, but they are also generated, perhaps predominantly, by differences of acquired culture, of language, dress, habits, morals, or religion. There is no cure for such antipathies, except a broadened education, a knowledge of history, may teach us that civilization is a cooperative product, that nearly all peoples have contributed to it. It is our common heritage and debt, and the civilized soul will reveal itself in treating every man or woman, however lowly, as a representative of one of these contributory groups. So you can see that there is kind of a big package of the Durant vision of history. It's this kind of great, you know, universal epic that we all belong to and we all contribute to the um, you know, the, the, the great people who have biographies and, and also just the ordinary people as well. And it's for people of every corner of the earth to have something to contribute to, to it. Um, which is why he you know, focuses the first volume uh, on Eastern history. Although make no mistake, this is very much a, a Eurocentric series. I mean, the next 10 volumes just focus on Western history. Um, but and you know, we should also notice the phrasing, nearly all peoples. Uh, this is a, a man who uh, you know, throws around the term barbarian without any shame. But 
I think it still encapsulates kind of a, an admirable view, uh, an admirable view of history, in which it's kind of this, you know, something that is not, you know, is something not just to be read by everyone, but it's something that everyone also is a part of. It's kind of everyone's heritage. That's why it's called our Oriental heritage. It's the sort of it belongs to to all of the world's people. So, in the rest of the series, he kind of continues on with from Greece to, to Rome to medieval history, onto Italian Renaissance, onto the Reformation, and he goes right up until the time of Napoleon. This took him over 40 years, all of this. He was going from the early 1930s when he started writing, all the way up to his death in 1981, in a, in a pandemic, of course. Um, and he had plans to take it right up to um, the present day, right up into the 20th century, but he, you know, he, he just didn't have time. So he only, he only got up to Napoleon. So of the series itself, we could say that its focus is mainly on culture, art and philosophy and society, rather than politics or military history, which we might expect if someone whose background is in philosophy. Um, and interestingly, there are also elements of social history. So he sort of, you know, he, I mean, he definitely dwells on you know, the, all the great names of history and definitely you know, there's, there's plenty of space of work and political maneuvering and whatnot, but he, he has kind of this interesting idea that's sort of behind the facade of political and military history and all the turmoil. There are sort of always a million ordinary, orderly lives um, in which people just kind of go about things um, you know, sort of regardless of the political happenings of the day, and this is kind of one of the real driving forces of, of history. It's not just kind of, you know, what the people in charge of them, it's kind of what the ordinary people think and do and say and how they kind of order their lives. And so he has a, 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 a big focus on morality. Uh, this is sort of one of the, one of the things he focuses on, on, on in his history. And uh, he sort of loves, uh, you know, quoting Moralists, I, mean, I guess he's a bit of a uh, conservative guy in some ways. You know, he sort of it, somehow in every book he sort of you know has a little chapter on the morals of the age, and somehow the morals are always loosening. They're always getting worse. Every everyone's always you know degenerating, and somehow um, you know when everything's falling into decay and nothing's really working how it should. And you know he sort of notes some of this kind of you know he's a bit self-aware about how. Order. This is moralizing, and it can't really be true because you know how can things always just be degenerating? You know, it's kind of you know, things are just kind of always carrying on as they were. But it's still you know sort of interesting in a way to sort of you know how he kind of threads all these all these different moralizers sort of going about doom and gloom. Um, you know, it creates kind of a So I, it's, 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 it's interesting as to you know, how it is that you know we always hear such things about you know how everything's works and how everything's spiraling out of control. But you know, Wilderian sort of you know he, he he kind of buys into that, but he sort of raises his eyebrow and kind of a bit you know is, is, it, is it still spiraling out, spiraling out of control? Um, and he has. One of the interesting things about the story of civilization is that he has a good thing to say about everyone and everything. Everything is made a positive, everyone's made a positive contribution to history in some fashion or another, whether he's talking about Attila the Hun, or whether it's Pericles, or whether it's Machiavelli, or whether it's Sun Yat-sen, somehow is a good thing to say about every single one of these people. And as you can imagine, this sort of makes him a man of uh, fairly flexible opinions at times. You know, he's someone who welcomes the radical and the conservative. Um, and this means that, you know, he, he's sort of a bit disarming in a way, because there's something there for everyone to like, but it's also kind of frustrating, because, you know, this would never really pin down what this Will Durant guy really thinks. Because he's just kind of, you know, saying so many good things about everyone. But there are some, Issues in which he reveals his colours uh, sort of a bit more explicitly. Um, you know, there, there's a general kind of uh, prudishness 
to his work, so I think that we would perhaps expect that the man who was born in 1885 would have. Um, he also has a habit of overgeneralizing things, which can you believe in a work done by an amateur spanning you know, all of human history pretty much, he does have a tendency to overgeneralize, but you know, even, even just within paragraphs, he has this kind of, you know, sometimes he is just a little more interested in, you know, kind of making interesting phrases, interesting paragraphs, and, you know, there is a bit of accuracy, I suppose, is lost there. I can, I can very much imagine that if someone had all the time in the world, they could go through every, you know, claim that Louis Lennon makes in his book and kind of every, every passage and they can go and kind of highlight it with red markers and all the time, you know, opposing views to all of it. Because, you know, I suppose a lot of it is wrong to an extent, and he acknowledges that. Of course, it's some of it's wrong just because it's merely outdated and you know, some of it he probably just got incorrect. But some things are sort of a little more, you know, this kind of um, attempt of his to make things very accessible for everyone. There are sort of times when that finds a bit of a snag, when it's kind of not all that successful. He has this thing where he always tries to convert uh, currencies for the reader into modern day equivalents. This is a pretty inexact science at the best of times, but it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's a bit nonsense really. He's talking about, you know, how many, you know, talents of gold some cost in ancient Greece, and he tries to convert that to, you know, 1939 dollars. And, you know, I'm listening to this, and I mean, you know, well, what is a US dollar now, let alone back in 1939? You know, it's kind of all of it, all of it meaningless. So there are times in which his, his attempts to be relatable to the reader do just kind of fall flat. Um, but the style is, is what really makes it. I mean, you know, it, it, it is, he, he does have a real poetry to uh, the language. You know, he has, a, he has a real good sense of you know, turn of phrase and, and all. Uh, you know, just kind of the, the flow and the computer, I suppose, of, of, of things, which at times makes him sort of a bit overly perfect. But this, he, he, he still, Gives, uh, you know, he, he still pays the proper attention to the horrors of history, I suppose, as we would call it. And it's worth noting that this was, the series was a very big success in its time. It was featured in the book, every uh, volume was featured in the Book of the Month Club, which was sort of this big, uh, you know, and this was like the Oprah Winfrey's book club of, of its time, you know, it's sort of every, you know, if, if you're a person like reading back in America in the 20th century, you know, you were subscribed to this and you were getting a, a copy of Will Durant sent to you, you know, this was, and, you know, you go to your grandmother's house, there's probably, you know, one or two volumes stood around of it, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. It was sort of one of these big, uh, you know, popular works of the 20th century. And it's still actually getting, uh, you know, uh, some, some real honors. He, he won the Pulitzer Prize for, the Age of Voltaire, which is the, whatever volume that is, in, in the 70s. And in 1977, for his volume, Rousseau and Revolution, the second last one, he actually won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So he became sort of quite a, a public intellectual. And, you know, he's, he's yeah, he, he became kind of a historian of, of some stature, despite the fact that he never actually was you know, a professional historian, his amateur was writing outside of the university system the whole time. He was just kind of, you know, researching all of his own uni, his own kind of method, you know, all, all just kind of doing it. With a bit of a whim, I suppose. And I think that's one of the impressive things about the story of civilization, is that it's, this, this isn't the accumulative knowledge of some, you know, historian who's, you know, studied all these things for, you know, X amount of years. This is just, you know, someone who is literate, who is just interested in history, who decided to dedicate his life to it. And I think that that's, you know, sort of one of the main reasons why perhaps you should read Will Durant is it's this reminder that, you know, at this stage in my life, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to, you know, actually go through with my dream of, of becoming a, an academic historian or something. But it's, so it's so it's sort of, you know, it's comforting to know, I suppose, that you know, Will Durant reminds us that 
you know, so long as you are literate and so long as you are passionate about history, you really can kind of produce a work that people want to read. It just as long as you kind of dedicate yourself to it, and as long as you kind of focus enough on you know, the language and kind of making it accessible and making it interesting, you know, maybe that's kind of what what's really about is it's about making history interesting for people. So halfway through writing the series, in I think it was 1965, you wrote a thin little book called The Lessons of History, reflecting on certain aspects that you were kind of illuminated through you know, all, writing all these books and reading them. And it's sort of where he got to outline his own ideas on history, be a bit more subjective about things. And he reflects what it is to study history. And he says, to those who study history, not merely as a warning reminder of man's follies and crimes, but also as an encouraging remembrance of generative songs, the past sinks to be a depressing chamber of horrors. It becomes a celestial city, a spacious country of the mind, wherein a thousand saints, statesmen, inventors, scientists, poets, artists, musicians, lovers and philosophers still live and speak, teach and carve and sing. The historian will not mourn because he can see no meaning in human experience except that which man puts into it. Let it be our cry that we may ourselves put meaning into our lives. And that right there sort of encapsulates kind of the humanist dream of history that Wilderin encapsulates. And whether you think it's over optimistic or naive or not, I think that there is, I think it's definitely worth considering, I think it's definitely worth contending with, and I think that that, above all, is probably why you might consider reading Will the Wren. Thank you. <laughs> right, do we have any questions? Yeah? I think she may have. I think I think Ariel um, won both of them as well. I think you're right about that. Yeah, I think it was both of them. Anything else? Yeah. It's definitely an interesting um, study into you know what um, you know amateur history of the 20th century looked like, and there's definitely a lot of the kind of values and you know like, yeah, reading through it, you know you definitely get a good a good sense of kind of what this Victorian you know, he essentially was just a man from the Victorian era who's kind of lived on for 96 years, his 96 years of living life, and kind of just kept on living, living, living through the 20th century, and it's kind of an interesting document in that sense, in that, yeah, it, it does kind of reflect a lot of, um, of that in the book, but it, 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 you know, he clearly has got a lot of cues from, um, you know, the sources, he was sort of big on, on um, you know, as you'd imagine an uh, amateur historian would do, he, he looked a lot at, uh, you know, kind of the kind of more, you know, he's reading primary sources, there's more kind of thing that he's is kind of going through all the all the classics, you know. He's not really looking at what you know, what the scholars would and you know trying to compare this fragment that was found on this kind of you know steel line or something, or you know, looking at these inscriptions here and there and kind of cross-referencing them. You know, he's just kind of um, you know going with kind of the, the common narrative that's kind of you know already kind of pre-packaged. So it's 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 not an especially original, you know, the historical taste you're gonna get 
in the story of civilization, you know, not, yeah, they're, they're not exactly original, you know, um, and they are kind of, yeah, that, that is sort of the, 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 uh, the history of the kind of primary sources kind of bleeds through a bit now, I guess, of um, the secondary sources that he was reading were probably from the early 20th century as well, so you kind of, a, a fair bit of that does come through there. historical knowledge I'm solely relying on this guy for. I mean, you know, everything, you know, you know, so far I'm, I'm, I've reached the 17th century just in volume seven. And, you know, I'm sure there are whole, um, you know, whole historical eras and historical characters that I have heard nothing about other than from this book. And so it's kind of, you know, even on a personal level, like how much of my kind of conceptions of history is just exclusive. Um, to will the rent. But at the same time, I probably would have been you know, ignorant of these things you know, had I never picked up the story of civilization. I, would, I mean, I would have probably read something else in its place, but I probably would have read you know, kind of a whole suite of history. And I think that, that kind of little bit, he says, uh, it's, um, it's this thing about, you know, in the midst of un unprecedented learning, popular ignorance flourished. You know, it's this sort of, if they weren't getting it from the other end, would, would, would the American worker be getting, um, you know, would, would, would they be reading a whole sweeping 12 volume history of, uh, yeah, 12 volume history of the world all at once? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I think maybe the tip is it's here and there, but I think kind of, you know, this popularizing thing, you know, it has a real democratic thrust. It's about giving people the chance to engage with history where they might not otherwise. Have done rather than just yeah yeah oh oh yeah yeah you mentioned there's a thousand volumes of um, history of knowledge in this series of books but is a volume of knowledge that like a thousand or like ten thousand people have uh, access to this book? Oh yes yeah so um, the reviews to each volume of the story of civilization were sort of quite mixed. Um, and not, a lot of scholars kind of like to bash on, uh, you know, in, each time it came out, you know, some, some sort of scholar would hop on who was an expert in, you know, that field of history that he was writing about, and they would kind of bash about it, and would, would sort of say, no, he got this wrong and that wrong, and he wasn't careful in the middle, and he sort of should rely on me for this, that kind of thing. But, so yeah, there, there was a lot of, um, yeah, critical uh, reception coming from, from scholars. Although a lot of scholars also did acknowledge that, um, you know, what Will Durant was doing was kind of very uh, admirable and he was a very sort of engaging writer. He was good at telling a story. You know, they all kind of had to, had to begrudgingly admit that at least. Um, but for uh, just, you know, regular reviewers from, you know, all the American newspapers, they generally all gave a positive review. So, you know, they loved it. You know, this was kind of history that was written in their kind of, their kind of language, their kind of way. Um, so I pretty much always got popular reviews from the press, but not so much from actual 